Welcome back to Coding Shorts. I'm Sean Wildermuth. In the last Coding Shorts, I talked about middleware in ASP.NET Core. And we're going to start today by discussing different kinds of middleware. In this episode, we're going to be talking about response caching, how that can help you with some performance issues. Let's take a look. So I want to talk to you today about response cache middleware. Now, what is response caching? When we want to reduce the load on a server, we might not want to redo work that is already the same as last time it was called. So if I go ahead and start this server, just so you can see what it's up to, and I'm just going to use curl to go to that server and return some data. In fact, I'm just going to that home page. We can see the server is just returning some HTML page just like a browser would do, but we're more interested in the API. Response caching doesn't really work well for UI elements. There is a feature coming in .NET 7 called output caching that existed in ASP.NET before Core came around, and that's being brought in, and response caching can be helpful for that. This is for a specific kind of caching of calls, especially API calls, that the browser can deal with. So if I come back and do this curl again, I can just say API messages. So we're just calling that API and we're getting some JSON back. And notice over here, I have logging a message that says loading the messages. And what is happening there? This is super simple, but I wanna make sure you can see all the moving pieces. That call to API messages, because this is our route and this is a get, is logging that we're loading the messages and we're returning directly from Entity Framework core context, just some data in the database. And you wouldn't be surprised that if I call this multiple times, that that method is being called each and every time, right? That's just the way APIs work. Nothing should be surprising here, but this is without response caching. Because the, ostensibly all of this data is the same, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to go back to the server and especially back to the database every time we made this call, because this data might not be all that volatile. So let's stop the server a second and let's introduce the middleware. So if we come down to where we're configuring this server, and this could be in setup.cs or in program.cs like I'm using in later versions of .NET Core, what I'm gonna show you and how it works goes back to earlier versions of ASP.NET Core. So if you're not using the latest version of ASP.NET Core, this will still work. And so all we're going to do is add some middleware called use response cache, use response caching. Like much of the middleware we work with, we also need to add all the services that are required. So let's come down here and on the services collection, I'm just going to say add response caching. So with these two pieces, we're adding the response caching into the list of middleware. Typically, this should be before you map to actual controllers, razor pages, or whatever you're using there, but after authorization, routing, and cores. That's where it usually fits into that pipeline. So it's important to know that you don't want anyone just getting this response cache, so you want to make sure that if it's that if it's authorized, you're not gonna accidentally do that. And more importantly, that you've already done the handshake with cores if that becomes something you're already doing. So with this small change, let's go ahead and run the project again. And I'll go ahead and get those messages again, right? Same thing, loaded them. And if I do it a second time, we're not seeing any change in behavior, right? I called it twice, it went to the database twice. It's not really what we want. And that's because adding the middleware just allows for the ability to do response caching, not make every element in your website automatically response cached, because that could be a real problem. If you're dealing with volatile data or the UI, you don't want all of that cached on the server. If we go back to that controller, this is where we would opt into response caching. And it can be at the action level or at the controller level. Now note that it really only works with gets and options because put, post, delete, etc. they actually are operations. They aren't just getting data that could be cached. They're actually doing operations. So you don't want a post to be cached because you actually want that action to happen to the database every time. 
And what we do here is we add an attribute, which I'll add to the whole controller, called response cache. Now with just response cache, it actually won't do anything anymore because we have to set one or two parameters. The first is the duration. And this is how many seconds it's going to cache it. And often when we're trying to do this, we're not talking about a lot of seconds. So let's cache them for one minute. And I also have to tell it the location of the cache. And this can be no location, which is effectively turning off cache control. And this is useful when you're using it on a controller where one of the methods you don't want cached. Client says it's only going to can't handle this via cache control headers. Now cache control headers are something the browser looks at to determine whether it should be going back to the server at all. We're going to leave it as any because we want not only the browser to cache it, but we also want the server to cache it for us as well. These are changed for different scenarios, but you need to define at least these to make response caching work. So let's restart this. Now we've put that response cache in right here. And let's go ahead and do that same curl. In fact, I'm going to add the ability to see the headers as well. We loaded it and notice that we have this cache control header now added and it says max age 60 for 60 seconds. Curl doesn't really respect any of that. It's just a, a raw. But if this were in the browser, the browser would know not to go to the specific URL next time to just return a cached copy of it. So if we call it again, hopefully within 60 seconds, we're getting that same piece, but notice no new loading message. For the first second, we're never going to get that new piece. And that's because when we specified that the location of the response cache, any means it's going to be handled on the server and the client. If we change this, let's stop this for a minute and do client only. And let's run this. Again, we're only doing it on the client. We're getting that first call. We're still telling the browser to deal with that caching. But when we call it again, we're going to, the server is going to call it yet again, because curl itself isn't managing this cache control. And this may be very true with certain clients you're using, whether that's JavaScript or whether that's a C sharp project somewhere. And so you might want the server to actually, even if the client is ignoring it, still supporting the caching. In our particular case, we don't need this, but there are a couple other parameters I want to talk about, and I'm going to break these into multiple lines so they're a little easier to see. And they are vary by header or vary by keys. Now, this allows you to specify a header when you want to essentially break the cache, but more importantly, qu by query keys. So we're saying that create a new copy of this caching dependent on what the query strings are. And that way, this get will get two cached copies, one where latest is true and one where latest is false. Now, if we had a, another API here in the more typical way of having something like get one, and we'll leave that there, where we're just returning a single message, with something like an ID, and we'll say where, let me move this up a bit on the page in case you have uh, some of the controls hiding it on the bottom of YouTube. And I'm just gonna say that the ID is gonna equal our ID and then just say first async, right? Now you might think that this cat vary by query keys is going to affect this, but in fact it's not because this call and this call are different URIs, right? This one is just API messages and this one is API messages one. And so we come back here, run our project again, and we'll call that list for messages, right? We get those messages in, but what happens if we then say messages one? That's still gonna load the data with only the item that's being returned because those are considered two different calls. And so if I go back to messages, it's returning it without getting the data. If I go back to messages one, still not loading it because it's the same data. But if I change the message I'm looking for, that does have to load it because it is being cached by the URI.
by this magic string. So this is one of those pieces of middleware when I do code reviews is often missing. The, often you're getting the benefit of this with very little work, right? You're specifying some response cache, but lots of projects don't turn it on because they don't think about the necessity for caching some of these objects. Now, of course, if you have volatile data, this might not be useful at all, but imagine something like a typical catalog that doesn't change every 60 seconds, unlike maybe Amazon's. You might want to cache this for much longer, only when it changes, or to invalidate the cache in certain ways. And you can control that when you get deeper into the middleware of specifying how the caches work and all of that. But out of the box, this gives us a lot of functionality we want. Thanks for joining me for yet another coding short. I hope I taught you something about response caching and why you might want to use it. If you've gotten this far, please like and subscribe. I have read the YouTube manual, and that's what I'm supposed to say at the end of these, but it really does matter. It really does help me. Any like, subscribe, or sharing of this video will really help. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.